Welcome to the Time Machine with Trish and Mike. I'm Mike. And I'm Trish. And we're glad you're with us again for another adventure through time. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, I, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> How are you today, Trish? I am great. I can't believe that it is the 28th of January already. It is. That means February will be here within a couple of days. And... We are rapidly moving through the year 2021. I know. So exciting. Yes, it is. And uh, you have brownies baking, so that is even more exciting. <laughs> I have brownies baking. Yeah. And I was busy. We had a big windstorm here in Edmonton, so I was busy um, hauling away a chopped log that had fallen on our roof. So that was great today. That sounds really fun. I mean, glad, obviously, that there was no damage or anything. That would yeah. be but not a good way to get... But firewood for the there summertime <laughs> when we go camping. Ah, very, very nice. That That is one way to look at it. Right. Got to be positive about these things. Absolutely. And you, you've been busy with work and life. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. Nothing too exciting really yeah. going on um it's but like covid makes you know making brownies and hauling wood exciting it, it really has <laughs> you know you you really have come to appreciate the little things that you do mm -hmm. that uh, i don't know it's i'm encouraged that we are starting to make some progress though at getting it, it's going to be a slow process it's not going to be something that's going to happen overnight right. but i i'm encouraged that we're making some progress forward and through vaccines and treatments that we are slowly getting better. Yeah. To, to think that literally at this point a year ago, we were yeah. still going about life completely normal and that there is now some light at the end of the tunnel. Because once this thing took over, you know, March, April last year with the lockdowns and everything. Things were intense it, in March and April. Uh, we didn't know how long this thing was going to go on so that yeah. we're, we got stuff to look forward to in 2021. Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately though, we do have a pair of rather somber anniversaries to discuss in yeah. this week's. Well, and I know we've always said we wanted our, our pod podcast to be kind of uh, more uplifting and interesting base, but sometimes there's just certain events in history that you just have to hit on. They're just so significant that if you ignore them, it's it, it's not appropriate. You know what right. I, mean? I totally agree. And this year is the 35th anniversary mm -hmm. of the Space Shuttle Challenger accident. Which is actually on this date, right? January 28th in 1986. That's so right. So very appropriate. Yes. And um, Trish is going to talk about that here in just a second. And as a segue to that, we will be getting into the discussion of the Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy, which occurred on February 1st, 2003. So, uh, Trish, tell us um, a bit about Challenger. Like we've already said, it's the 35th anniversary of this disaster. I was just a little kid, like uh, only a couple of months old. I was born in June, so I wasn't quite a year yet. And my mom always tells the story of watching it and my brother's who are five and nine years older than me were around. And for her, it was really personal. And now for me, it feels really personal because of course, the teacher that was on board. So we'll go back to the beginning of a little bit of the history of Challenger. So Space Shuttle Challenger was actually named after the British Naval Research Vessel, HMS Challenger, that sailed the Atlantic and Pacific, and Pacific Oceans during the 1870s. And so it's kind of fitting that they chose this name for the space shuttle because it was so important to the space program. It's launched for its maiden voyage on April 4th, uh, 1983. And that mission actually saw the first spacewalk of the space shuttle program. And it launched the first American woman, Sally Ride, into space. Challenger also made history with the first space shuttle landing at Kennedy Space Center. And uh, Challenger's services to the American space program 
of course, ended in tragedy, January 28th, 1986. Just 76 seconds, or 73 seconds into the mission, there's going to be a booster failure that causes an explosion that's going to result in the loss of all seven astronauts as well as the vehicle. Growing up, obviously, here in Florida, mm-hmm. shuttle launches are, are a big thing. And I, you know, I don't have the memory of seeing this happen, but my mom has subsequently told me that she took me out to watch the shuttle launch that day. Mm-hmm. And she remembered seeing that this, and when you see the clip, knowing what, once you know what to look for in a shuttle launch, yeah. you instantly know that something, something was not right. Right. Which uh, about is, this one. It was so tragic, right? With the with the family members watching, at first a lot of people didn't know what was going on. They just thought it was the next stage in liftoff. And so when right. you when you see that clip, it's I don't know, it's kind of eerie when you when you hear them kind of cheering at first and then they realize something's wrong. Right, but they don't know what. Yeah. And and you don't know okay, is that survivable was like cuz you don't really know what happened where that explosion happened is their capsule still okay there's in that moment and especially for like you said a lot of teachers uh, students Mm -hmm. in classrooms all across the country and and well and they were all watching it live right live yeah yeah Yeah. so of course it is that the more human aspect and well it's a human story obviously no matter what but when something like this happens and it's specifically trained personnel but once you have like a teacher like uh, nasa was really humanizing the program and personalizing it by having this civilian right high school teacher krista mccoffrey she was a 36 year old mother to two social studies teacher from new hampshire Um, and had been teaching for about 15 years when she was picked for the space program. She started in 1970 teaching. So for me, that really hits home. I'm 36. I'm a mother of two. Uh, You know, it just, you you put yourself in, in her place as someone who is so excited for her students to learn about space and to see if you work hard at something and you have a goal in mind and you can achieve it and knowing they're watching live Right? It must have been yeah. such, you know, a crazy experience for her. Oh, for sure. I mean, the adrenaline rush just of being involved in a launch. Yeah. Uh, and then actually to have taken off. And it's, I... I can't even imagine. Just being picked, yeah. right? Like, there yeah. was 11,000 teachers who applied for the spot on the shuttle. Of these 11,000 teachers, 114 were then picked to actually go to the space center to get some more training to be interviewed. And out of that, we end up with 10 teachers that are the finalists before they narrow it down to McCoffrey and Barbara Morgan, who just in case she was a backup. McCoffrey was the first teacher in space. And in a couple of the previous missions, NASA had sent up a U.S. congressman and a U.S. senator as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think in the Netflix documentary on Challenger, which is a absolute must watch. Yeah, if you're interested in this, yeah. there's a ton of behind the scenes footage and stuff, documentary stuff that I had no idea even mm-hmm. existed. Whoever had the idea to film all this stuff was way ahead of their time because it is a wonderful documentary and well worth your watch. Oh, absolutely. I binged it. Like we've discussed how incredible the the amount of footage and and really everything that they were documenting. I mean, I know that it's they were clearly trying to get footage to increase that desire for people to be invested in the space program again and and have a connection to these people. But still just brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. So the two are actually going to train together from 1985 uh, to 86. And then NASA had selected teachers to begin with because they wanted them to teach live lessons again sparking that revived interest not only in the space program but in youth wanting to get involved in science i guess that was like a big thing going on in the american science curriculum was they wanted to have more students follow a technology innovation in science or go off yeah and you still have that today with a lot of stem programs and stuff that are real popular with educators which is a great thing yeah and this is like, then I have to kind of pause the mom part of me because it's just so 
touching what ends up happening is um, McAfee would board the Challenger armed with her nine-year-old son, Scott's stuffed animal, a frog named uh, Flegel for good luck. And she was quoted as saying, I realize that there's a risk outside your everyday life, but it doesn't frighten me. So just being so fearless, right? Really a woman of uh, integrity and courage and just a role model. So of course we know 73 seconds after liftoff, the shuttle became engulfed in flames and exploded. NASA is going to suspend all missions while it investigates. And the culprit's going to turn out to be uh, two rubber O-rings that were supposed to seal the rocket booster section. And it had failed because of the chilly temperatures of the launch that morning. The rubber had cracked and it never really sealed. And what's really tragic is engineers had actually discovered the issue earlier and had just kind of kept putting off resolving the issue. They kind of kept pushing their luck until their luck ran out. I never realized quite, I mean, we've talked about in other episodes, uh, the, how cold it can get in Florida and the iguanas falling and hibernating. I never actually realized mm-hmm. that it could get that chilly in Florida. Yeah, it does. It's not, it doesn't happen often, mm-hmm. obviously. And that day was a particularly very cold day. Uh, temperatures were below freezing for a while. Once you start getting kind of to the central Florida area, mm-hmm. Um, It doesn't happen as often as like North Florida, especially like up in the Panhandle and places like that. It can get below freezing very frequently because it's basically southern Alabama or southern Georgia. Right. But the further south you go, you start to get more wind and water begins to affect the land more. So that tends to not let it get as cold. Right. But that day it was cold. Yeah. I, and uh, engineers have been quoted as saying like if they had delayed the flight for it, even just to be a, a couple of degrees warmer, it likely would never have tra- uh, would have happened. The tragedy wouldn't have happened. And another really startling aspect of the whole thing is not only does this happen and it's and students are watching live and the families are watching live. They realize through their investigation of of the explosion that the crew likely survived the initial explosion. And uh, they have uh, an uh uh-oh from the pilot is recorded at the time. Experts who investigated claim the crew were likely still conscious for at least six to 15 seconds afterwards. They're not 100% sure at the time, but for sure they they were conscious and realized that there was an explosion. Uh, but it has not been ruled out that they actually, uh, they may have still been alive as the capsule hit the water. And then because of the speed of the capsule, no one would have been able to survive the G-force. So uh, air packs are actually given to the astronauts on the shuttle, and it gives them about five minutes of usable air, just in case a tragedy or something does happen with the air supply on the shuttle. And uh, they said that they have to be manually deployed. And of the four that were found, three were deployed by crew members. And I just think how utterly tragic and terrifying right? it must have been for these, you know, it's already, you already have to be so brave and daring to want to be an astronaut. Right. Right. And just in For that sure. moment, holy moly, I can't even imagine. And that's something that kind of ties into Columbia as well, because as part after the incident happens with Columbia, there's some discussion how survivable it would have been. And one of the issues that was brought up was the impact and even just the pressure in the atmosphere as they would have been falling or whatnot, you you know, because their helmets are not designed like a race car helmet or something to limit your head movement. So your head would kind of be bouncing around in the helmets and, and all that. And you're, you're strapped in, but it's not designed for you to, your body's going to move too much. Right. Yeah. It's designed for a certain amount of G force, right? Right. That you have to be a whole different kind of breed of person to want to go up in these rockets. I just can't, I can't even imagine. It's definitely not something on my bucket list. Being in space would be really cool, but the whole getting there part would be the part that would, that would kind of, yeah. And and as we've seen, unfortunately, in these two examples, yeah, we have accidents happen. There is kind of a positive note for it all, right? They they discover the issue, mm-hmm. they fix the issue. Barbara Morgan, who had been that alternative, is actually going to take on the duties of the official title was teacher in space. 
So she takes on those official duties uh, and she does it from March until July 86. And then uh, she returns to her teaching job in the fall. 12 years later, NASA is actually going to ask her to come back and train, not as a civilian, but actually as, a, as an astronaut. So she goes through a whole different program. And in August of 1998, uh, she's going to start training at Johnson Space Center, and she's going to become a mission specialist, eventually working in the Capcom and robotics branch. And August of 07, she finally makes it up into space on the shuttle Endeavor, becoming the first educator astronaut to reach orbit. And I love her quote. She says, uh, if we don't take any risks at all, we're not going anywhere. And we teachers encourage our students all the time in the classroom to take some risks. Right? And having been such a good friend of Krista's and training together and going through that tragedy and still willing to go and do this. I don't know. I just think that's so incredible. And she did say she, she said she felt like a bit of Krista was with her as she was going up into the, up in Endeavor. That's, that's really cool. And it's fitting that she went to space on Endeavor because Endeavor was built as the replacement for Challenger. Right. Yeah. Out of tragedy humanity returns like the phoenix right i guess and you find the positive and you you learn and you know better and you do better as my angelo is quoted as saying one good thing that comes out of the columbia accident is much of the data was transmitted during the mission so there was a, still a lot of the experiments and that sort of stuff and the results they learned from the mission because it was transmitted and they were actually even able to recover some of the specimens and stuff oh, really? from the debris Oh, wow. I wouldn't have thought watching that happen, right? You wouldn't think anything would be salvageable. In fact, even a couple of months after the Columbia accident, they found a Petri dish that had worms in it that, that were from Columbia. And the worms were alive still, like viable? They were. Wow, that's incredible, right? You think, how does, yeah. how does such a small organism survive? That's just crazy. So they were in there sealed in their Petri dish in some sort of uh, like aluminum box or something. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, that, that is crazy. So Columbia launched in mid January of 2003. It was, this was a significant mission because it was the carried the first Indian woman and the first Israeli man were on. Oh, interesting. I didn't realize flight. it was a um, international mission. Mm -hmm. So cool. Yeah. Interesting fact, commander Rick husband that was on Columbia, he actually was the pilot for STS-96, which was the first shuttle mission to dock with the International Space Station. Oh, wow. So we have quite quite a few yeah. interesting ast like veteran astronauts going on on this mission. Yeah. Basically, what winds up happening is 81.7 seconds after launching, a suitcase-sized piece of foam breaks off from the external tank, you know, a big orange tank that you see the shuttle attached to. And it struck the left wing of Columbia. I remember after they they realized when they do the playback and they see that, right? They kept showing that one image over and over again on the news of that piece falling. And there was all that mm -hmm. debate on if it actually caused any damage. Right? So right away, it's, it's amazing what they can pick up, you know, two minutes into a mission already. Oh, yeah, for sure. And with technology now and HD cameras and stuff, we could see a lot. More, yeah. more stuff. It kind of makes you wonder if we had that technology at the time, what we could have potentially picked up on, mm -hmm. because this was not the first shuttle that had damage from foam falling off the tank. It had happened on several other flights, but they never found it to be a problem because it never caused right. this sort of damage mm -hmm. before or this sort of failure before. It's like once you kind of accept that that's a possibility, it's easier Right. Oh, it happened before. It's not a big deal now. Right. And you don't realize the effect that it can have. Uh, when the foam hits the space shuttle Columbia, the Columbia was traveling at almost 1900 miles an hour. So that's just a little bit over 3000 kilometers an hour. So there you think a piece of foam doesn't. But when you you hit something going that fast, oh, yeah. it can cause damage. So. Once you know this damage occurs, what options would have been out there? Would a repair mission have been feasible? Would a recovery, a rescue mission? And so one of the things that the investigation turned up was that you basically had a couple of options. One, you could have done a rescue mission. 
And the question becomes, how long could Columbia have stayed in space and how quickly could you have gotten another shuttle up there to rescue? Now, mind you, you know how they would coordinate this. I would imagine they would have to involve connecting to the International Space Station probably somehow. Oh, I can't even I can't imagine them doing it without the space. Yeah, the sta- space station. Because the space shuttles themselves are not designed to connect with each other right. because that had never there had never been a reason for that. So they had determined it would have been feasible because Atlantis was scheduled to launch March 1st. So just a month later, they determined they could have moved that up to as early as February 10th. Wow, it's fast. And Columbia, interestingly enough, had enough consumables on board. They could have stayed up until February 15th. So there was actually a five day window where this would have been feasible. Oh, interesting. So they did, they could have rationed enough and been fine. They could have. So here's the interesting thing that comes from that, though, is what do you do with Columbia now? Right. NASA would have been able to control its reentry, but it would not have been able to pilot it to land it. So they likely would have deorbited it and dumped it in the Pacific Ocean. So they're hoping mathematically they would have lined up the trajectory for it to just... Correct. Water, yeah. Because you would definitely, as we have talked in previous episodes, you do not want anything over land near any population. Exactly. And that's why the shuttles are launched from Kennedy Space Center, because they're facing out into the Atlantic Ocean for that very reason. If something goes wrong, it's going to land in the ocean and not on land somewhere. NASA later developed the remote control orbiter system so that way they could, if they had to, remote land the shuttle. So again... I always, I, I, well, and I hate the fact that this is like humanity, right? We always, something has to go wrong before we're, we're proactive. I I guess no one's ever really going to think of this possibility happening, but once you said it out loud, it's like, oh, that's a really smart idea. Like, why didn't we have that in place? You know, when we were designing the system. Yeah. But the fact that we learned from mistakes is something good yes. it's tragic that bad things happen mm-hmm. whether it's space accidents or just anything in general or just even in life yeah you know well you that just seems to be human do history something you learn from it yeah absolutely yeah. so that the other issue that they could have done would have been to try to do some sort of a repair they really didn't deem that this was feasible mm. did they have capabilities to do a space walk and stuff and go out there do we know that's really kind of one of the issues because they determined that doing sort of a repair would be high risk because they obviously had not planned for it. Right. And Columbia was not equipped with the Canada arm, which is the big robotic arm that you see sticking out. I mean, not obviously when it's launched, but like when you see it in space, right. you see this giant arm that was actually from Canada. So thank you it's for our your contribution. contribution. We actually, we have yes. like, I think we have a, a third Canada arm that we're contributing to NASA. It's supposed to be for the upcoming yes. lunar lander, lunar, lunar that, missions. Ooh. That is correct. You do, you are. So a unusual extravehicular activity would have been required. There was no training on how to get an astronaut to the wing to do any sort of repair. And they obviously would have been limited to using what they had on board, much right. like in Apollo 13, where they that scene where they yeah. dump everything on the table. We've got to do this to this with using this. Yeah. That's how kind of the it? scenario they would have been in. Yeah. And you have no way of knowing if what you're going to do is actually going to hold up. Right. And spacewalks are notoriously complicated and dangerous. Like we, the normal human beings like, oh, a spacewalk, cool. But astronauts themselves, when they're describing the amount of work and training and planning that goes into spacewalks, it's not just something you do on a whim. Right. While there was no training for them to get to the wings, they are actually trained to go to the underside of the shuttle if need be. Because on the underside of the shuttle, there are doors where the cords connect to the external tank. So if those, think of it like landing gear on a plane. So, you know, when when you take off, the landing gear retracts, these doors close. Okay. Same type concept, you know, these fueling hoses and stuff that are connected to the tank. After the external tank falls off, these doors close. Okay. Well, what if they stay open? That becomes a problem. Right. That affects the aerodynamics of trying to land and all that. So they are actually trained to go out and close them if they need be. But that's the underside. That's not out on the edge of the wing where this is. Right. 
well, you don't want to put it into training to go do this. And then, oh, by the way, go just a little bit further. Yeah. Ultimately, in all, over 85,000 pieces of debris were collected as part of the investigation. Uh, and they actually recovered about 38% of the vehicle. That's, I mean, pretty good considering. Because when you watch that footage... Yeah, and when you consider the massive, th this massive debris field... You know, you have stuff stretched out over hundreds of miles right? as the shuttle, you know, fell apart. Uh, in fact, even as late as eight years later, they were still finding debris. Wow. That would be so... Could you just imagine, like, you're out walking your dog or something and just come across some random piece of history? Unfortunately, that was one thing that kind of flared up in the immediate aftermath of this. People were finding stuff and trying to sell it on eBay, oh. which... Obviously got shut down very quickly. Yeah. But so not cool. Yeah. In an interesting kind of eerie sort of fact, Columbia was actually named after Columbia Redediva, which was the first American vessel to circ circumnavigate the globe. Oh. Columbia also would go on to become the name of the command module for Apollo 11 that Michael Collins stayed in while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were in the lunar module on the moon. And that command module was CM-107. Okay. And Columbia's final flight was STS-107. Oh, wow. That is eerie. Yeah. These connections with numbers. Yeah. Man. It's interesting as we move forward into space travel now, you know, the discussion of m traveling to Mars and everything has come up. When, in February of 1969, President Richard Nixon appointed a space task force group to begin recommending human space projects mm -hmm. past the Apollo moon landing missions. And one of the programs they came up with was to use you know, reusable space vehicles. That was the whole reason the space shuttle program became a thing. And one of the ultimate goals was to have a human landing on Mars by 1983 at the earliest... Ooh, that definitely and, didn't happen. And by the end of the 20th century, at the latest. S still didn't hit that mark. <laughs> didn't hit that. But that's interesting that that was one of the original plans. And it kind of makes you wonder, if Apollo 13 wasn't a successful failure, mm -hmm. and that's that's the quote from uh, the movie Apollo 13, right, where you know, yeah. and, you know, our and mission was called a successful, and it is, yeah. because it was a failure, but they still accomplished their goal. Well, they didn't land on the moon, but, but they, <laughs> they got home, which, yeah. which is ultimately, a, I would call that a success. Uh, you know, let's just hypothetically, let's say that they can't get them home. Right. Does that end the space program right there? You know, because there was already a decline in public interest by the time Apollo 13 happened, right? Like, I've read a lot on it. I was really fascinated by Apollo 13 once I saw the movie as a little kid. And mm -hmm. so doing research on it, they, they look at the numbers for the broadcast of their, their television broadcast that they had and how it was already reduced numbers. And people are like, well, we made it to the moon, whatever. They had kind of moved on. So maybe because of being the success story and everyone being so invested in if these men were going to make it back or not, there was that peaked interest. But maybe it does end right there if something had happened. Yeah. It would be interesting to see how history would have played out had, I mean, obviously we're certainly glad that they made it back. Right. I don't mean that, but it's like one of those alternative history timelines yeah. where what if this happened? How, what's the butterfly effect down the road? Right. Yeah. It's really fascinating to think about. Right. I love the fact that your presidents are having these very lofty goals, right? Like Kennedy's like, we're putting a man on the moon by the, the end of the sixties. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and we did. And you did. You did it. So while you guys down, you know, south are trying to put a man on the moon, my country is just trying to figure out its flag situation. Yes. <laughs> Which. Yes, you are. Right? But at least you contributed. You gave us the Canada arm. I guess so. But it just seems so oh. ridiculous. It's like you guys are putting a man on the moon by the end of the 60s. We would just like to have our own flag and not fight about it. Yeah. It seems very Canadian issue. But I'm sure you were polite about it. For the most part. 
I'm sure you could sit down with some pancakes and maple syrup and settle this. There was some heated debate that went on in the in the 60s, for sure. Tell us about it. In an interesting turn of events, right? We're recording for the 28th, where our first story was on the 28th. Canada is going to adopt its flag January 28th, 1965. So we have uh, several different flags that are going to be used in Canada before January 28th as its national flag, both before and after Confederation. Of course, Canada becomes a nation in 1867. So we're quite a bit younger than you all. Canada is going to end up using the Union Jack, which is the United Kingdom's Royal Union flag. And then another flag that we switch to is known as the Red uh, Ensign. While it's officially a naval flag used by Canadian ships during the 1890s, it's going to be uh, a combination of the Union Jack and the Shield of Canada. It's used unofficially both at sea and on land since the 1870s. In 1921, King George V, back to our um, royal history lesson here, it's going to grant royal arms to Canada. And the Shield of Canada's new official coat of arms took the place uh, on the Red Ensign. And it's this flag that then represents Canada during the Second World War. So we have attempts to change the flag as Canada breaks a little bit further away from Britain and we become more independent. We stand on our own feet after uh, the World Wars. In 1925 and again in 1946, there's attempts for a new design. But on both occasions, our project's actually shelved by our Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King. And he's really concerned that it's going to lead to political instability. So that's kind of a, a real Canadian. It's like, oh, no, we don't want to cause waves and have anyone be angry or upset. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that is the most Canadian thing. So Canadian. Now, it, there's tensions between our French Canadians and, and English Canadians, of course, since the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, where Britain won. And I always tell my students, you know, like, normally after you win a war, you, you want to kick the other guys out that didn't win, right? But in this instance, Britain is so concerned about the Americans that they realize they're going to need these French citizens living in British North America now as kind of a, a wall or a guard to kind of prevent the Americans from invading. And so they make some exceptions and allow the French citizens to keep certain things like their religion and their language rights. And of course, in 1812, you guys are going to attempt to take us over, right? So it was a good yes. it was a good gamble to keep these French citizens nearby. But so we have this tension. So as a compromise, the Canadian government chose to keep the Union Jack as the national flag and then it's going to fly the red ensign uh, from government buildings. Now, in Canada, we have the government and then we have the official opposition which is to hold the government accountable. I don't know if you guys use that term with your government. No, we don't use that term. We just have, you know, you have the party that's in power, right. which right now would be the Democrats. Biden is a, President Biden is a Democrat. The House and the Senate both have Democrat majorities. So the Democrat would be the party, the Democratic Party would be the party in power. And then you have the Republican parties, which are the minorities at this point. So for example, if your Senate was Republican, would you just say, oh, the Republican Senate? Or like, would you make a yes. distinction? Okay. Yes. Yeah. That, that would be how you, how you would phrase that. And when you have instances where, say, the Democrats have the majority in the House and the Republicans have the majority in the Senate, which had been the situation for the previous two years, you have, you know, a split Congress. Oh, okay. So it's really neat. So, yeah. So in Canada, it's very common to be like the government and the uh, opposition or official opposition. So in 1960, Lester B. Pearson is going to be the leader of the opposition party. And he basically calls on the prime minister to solve what is known as, quote unquote, the flag problem. To Pearson, the issue is critical in defining Canada as a unified, independent country. And he's actually going to become prime minister in 1963. And so then he promises to solve this question of the new national flag. It's like something he ran on for his platform, which is so funny. And he wants it solved by 1967. So for Canada's centennial. Again, you guys want to get a man on the moon. We just want a flag. So, <laughs> uh, you know, Pearson's going to propose a flag that actually has three red maple leaf leaves from one stem on a white background bordered by two blue stripes. And blue people. I've seen this before. People are not impressed with the blue, right? They're very upset. Blue is normally associated with the French. Red is normally French, associated right. with the British. So people are like, blue is not usually an official color. He's going to recommend this design to the members of parliament in 1964, but his proposal is hugely like opposed. 
So instead, in true Canadian fashion, we set up a parliamentary committee to discuss the matter. <laughs> They're given six weeks to come up with a flag. So uh, debate's going to be fierce. They're divided on what symbols to use, what colors to use. A lot of people want to retain the symbols of, you know, the colonial history of Britain. Others want to show kind of the future of where Canada's going. And anyway, the great flag debate period of time ends up with three designs that they're going to vote on. So we have Pearson's flag, the, the three maple leaf uh, with the white and blue. There's going to be a design with a central maple leaf, like Canada's current flag, the Union Jack. And Which I like. Yeah, it's a nice flag. I love our flag. And yeah. uh, it's going to have the historic royal banner of France. There's a blue background with three golden fleur-de-lis. So it's, it's kind of the traditional Canada flag with a little Union Jack and a little royal banner, the fleur-de-lis, in the corners. Okay. And then George Stanley, who is the Dean of Arts at the Royal Military College, recommends a design featuring a single stylized red maple leaf on the white background with two red borders, which sounds very familiar, right? So uh, it sounds like a winner to it me. It sounds like a winner. So October 22nd, 1964, the committee votes in favor of Stanley's single leaf design. And then two months later, now on January 28th, they're going to have a vote and it's approved by the House of Commons and approved by our Senate, which is kind of our second sober thought is what it's called in Canadian history. And it receives official proclamation from Queen Elizabeth II. And that's how we end up with our flag, right? Just before, there we go. two years before our 100th anniversary. Oh, Canada. Right. It's a beautiful flag. I love it. It is a nice flag. I, I like your flag. I like yours too. I think the American flag is very stylized, right? And, I do too. You, I like it. And Americans definitely know how to, you know, have the patriotic, like, fervor for their flag. Yes, that, that we do. Yes, we are, we are very, patriotic very patriotic with our flag. But... It's, it's a nice flag. It's got your flag's got a good story too. We'll have to get into that on its anniversary. That we will, because there is definitely a history to the U.S. flag and the different versions mm -hmm. over time. And when we, when we adopted the base model flag that we currently use, the only difference is obviously over time as we've added more states. The star field has changed right. from the original circular design that Betsy Ross created. Yeah, the circular design is actually kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool. We are patriotic about our flag. It's something we take a lot of pride in. And something that the people of Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, take a lot of pride in is being the home of Punxsutawney Phil and Groundhog Day, which is a big tradition there. Mm -hmm. And it actually comes from the Pennsylvania Dutch tradition that if a groundhog emerges from its burrow and sees its shadow due to clear weather, that it will retreat and prepare for six more weeks of winter. And if it doesn't, due to cloudiness, that spring will arrive early. The first official Groundhog Day did not occur until 1887. And Punxsutawney Phil did not get his name of Phil until 1961. Wow, really? And and thinking about our dates, like Canada's first Groundhog Day, we're way after you guys. It's not until February 1956 that we have our, our first one with Wyerton Willie, who's an albino groundhog from Wyerton, Ontario. So is Puxatawney your most famous? Yes, we do have some other celebrations in other cities. There's like Millitown Mel in Millitown, New Jersey, Buckeye Chuck in Marion, Ohio, Potomac Phil in Washington, D.C., Sir Walter Wally in Raleigh, North Carolina. That's cute. And Jimmy the Groundhog in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, the self-proclaimed groundhog capital of the world. Groundhog capital of the world? Yes. Wow. I would like to challenge, do they have a museum? Because we have a groundhog like museum where all the little groundhogs are actually, they're taxidermied in little outfits. That I don't know. That would be curious. <laughs> I've never been because, to this museum in Alberta, but apparently it exists. Well, it's funny you bring that up because part of the thing with Punxsutawney Phil is, so there's the inner circle, which is the group that oversees the whole celebration. Right. So the way it works is the vice president 
of the Inner Circle prepares two scrolls in advance of the actual ceremony, one proclaiming six more weeks of winter, one proclaiming an early spring. And then at daybreak, Punxsutawney Phil awakens from his burrow on Gobbler's Knob and is helped to the top of the stump by his handlers and explains to the president of the Inner Circle in a language known as Groundhoggies... <laughs> whether or not he's seen his shadow. The president is the only person who can understand this because he possesses an ancient wooden cane, which gives him the ability to interpret Phil's message. And then he directs the vice president to read the scroll to the crowd gathered as part of this whole. Oh goodness. (laughs) As part of this whole thing, it is pretended that Phil is a super centenarian and has the same groundhog from 1887. Yeah, we we have similar beliefs about some of our groundhogs, too, where they're just like, no, he just has continued to live and flourish in his little home. The actual lifespan of a groundhog in the wild is about six years. Really? Only six? I would have thought only it would be six closer years. to like 15 yeah. or something. And I hate to burst the bubble on this, but the inner circle actually scripts the ceremony in advance, and they decide beforehand whether or not Phil will see his shadow. What? The whole thing is a giant sham. It's a sham. I feel cheated. Yes. It's like, and every single time one of those guys says that it's going to be a longer winter drives me crazy. So yeah, I actually have statistics on how accurate their predictions are. So uh, it says ground day, groundhog day organizers maintain that the rodents predictions are accurate 75 to 90% of the time. So these are the people organizing uh, all of these events around the different groundhogs. However, at least in Canada, the Canadian data proves that the groundhog success rate is quite low. So meteorological data from 13 Canadian cities over the past 30 to 40 years indicate that there have been an equal number of sunny and cloudy days on the 2nd of February. And during this period, the groundhog predictions were correct only 37% of the time. So I guess these these organizers that already have it pre-planned out, <laughs> they're the ones that are accurate 37% of the time. Well, 37% is not bad, but you see the inner circle, they have a 100% success rate. Right, yes. <laughs> of course, that's what they tell people. Yeah. They don't actually have 100%, but it's, you know, when, when you're believing in this whole fantasy realm, you make up your own rules as you go along, and they claim to have 100% accuracy, but it is in no way no way near no that close no and you we have some interesting groundhogs as well so there are other than wireton willie in ontario in canada we have nine groundhogs so we have balzac billy from balzac alberta so he's the one that we always pay attention to here there's brandon bob in brandon manitoba winnipeg willow in winnipeg manitoba gary the groundhog in kleinberg ontario Oil Springs Ollie in Oil Springs, Ontario. Fred La Marmont in Val d'Espoir, Quebec. Two Rivers Tunnel in Huntington uh, on Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. Shubenacadie Sam, which is the one I grew up following along in Shubenacadie, Nova Scotia. And Dundas Donna, who's not actually a real groundhog, but a South American Cody in Toronto, Ontario. (laughs) Interesting. I I love that much like America, there's different Canadian cities that get in on the tradition yeah and normally if it wasn't covid there would be larger celebrations like in in wireton ontario they have a, a big pancake breakfast and there's like a hockey game and it's a big community event and tourist attraction and which i'm sure is the exact same with puxatani phil so yeah actually because of the film in oh yeah. because of the groundhog day movie it blew up prior to that they would only have maybe like 2000 people show up after that movie they would start having 10 20000 people wow. and there were some years they'd even have as many as 40000 people show up oh. for the event now that's drawing in some money right yes tourist dollars <laughs> yes and when you consider that the population of punxsutawney pennsylvania is approximately 5700 people wow, it is yeah. a huge boom to the local economy now of course 2021 yeah. they're not going to have that they are still going to have the event and it will be live streamed of course and everything cool. so everybody can be part of that and i'm but, told that phil will have a mask oh that's impressive on how they're going to get a groundhog to wear one i have a yeah, hard time getting my six-year-old to wear one <laughs> i i this uh, this i want to see so 
<laughs> that's I'm, I'm definitely to see this. that's gonna make me want to pay attention to that stream over you know balzac so which is just a fun <laughs> name to say in alberta yes Ball, <laughs> balzac did i say that right it's balzac C balzac because <laughs> it sure sounds like something else when I you know. say it <laughs> balzac it's it's it rolls off it's, the tongue. It, it's something. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of something, we got a couple. We got a couple significant literature anniversaries this week in history. Yes, do you want to start us off? Uh, I certainly can because it was on January twenty ninth, eighteen forty five. Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven was first published in the New York Evening Mirror. Oh wow. Right? Mm -hmm. It's so funny to think that he wasn't actually that popular until after his death. Yeah, you're right. And in fact, to commemorate him every year on his birthday on January 19th, do you know about the Poe toaster? No, you actually ended up mentioning it, but we never got to talk about it during that, that uh, week's episode. Yes. So the Poe toaster for decades, this person... We don't know who this person was, and it's likely that it was probably more than one person over time, given the fact that this tradition went on for over 70 years. But an individual dressed in black, wearing a hat and a white scarf, would pour himself a glass of cognac and raise a toast to Poe at his grave and leave three roses and an unfinished bottle of cognac. This person became known as the Poe Toaster and would appear in the early morning hours every January 19th on Poe's birthday. No one was ever able to figure out who it was. And eventually in 2010, there was no visit by the toaster. And several years went by without anyone doing it. So the Maryland Historical Society selected a new toaster in 2016 to revive the tradition. Wow. So you, there's so many interesting aspects of that, like the symbolism, like what's with the white scarf? the three roses, right? Yeah. Did this person just pass away or something else happened to them? Like they developed amnesia or Alzheimer's or something and just stopped remembering to go. So yeah, because the, the annual visitation originally began sometime in the thirties, the 1930s and continued for like 80 years. So, so that's already it's highly unlikely. It was yeah. not like it was being passed on to mm -hmm. somebody else to continue the tradition. Fascinating. But yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And I, there's so much about Poe that's just fascinating in general, like just from his upbringing to his marriage to, you know, even his death. No one actually knows how he passed away. There's a bunch of, of different theories. The, the theory that has emerged as the likeliest candidate is that maybe he was involved in cooping, uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with the term. Explain to us what cooping is. So cooping back in the day was you would find an individual, you would get them extremely drunk, you would change their various clothes, and you would drag them from a election ballot spot to spot so that they could vote multiple times in one election. And so people believe that uh, while Poe was away on business, that he was basically brought into this cooping scheme and then left in a ditch to basically get sick and die uh, after he had consumed too much alcohol. It's like, oh, it's a very tragic end to a you know very brilliant individual yes that is and it's unfortunate because kind of makes you wonder when you have these really creative people like poe how like what other stories could they have been working on in their mind that right. they didn't could, tell well, he when was so young when he passed right so again history all full of those what ifs which is why i love it so much but uh, that leads us into, and I feel like we're in Groundhog Day with, again, another January 28th date. But this time in 1813, we have Pride and Prejudice. Very different material than from Pose. Is, <laughs> just, is, just, just a little just bit. A little. Just, just, just a little bit different. <laughs> uh, it's published 208 years ago. Pride and Prejudice is, uh, some interesting things about it is it's been translated into 35 different languages and actually made into 17 films. Which I think I have seen, I've seen a lot of different variations of Pride and Prejudice. I did not realize that it was 17 different variations of the, of the book made into film. 
I did not either until it's, you just shared that with us. It's a lot. So uh, yeah. Jane Austen had actually written Pride and Prejudice at the age of 21. Do you want to know what the original title was called? It wasn't actually Pride and Prejudice. What was it? It was originally supposed to be called First Impressions. Doesn't hmm. have the same ring to it. No. No. But no, I guess doesn't. fitting about a story where a girl dislikes a boy after their first rude meeting. So first impressions are quite important. They are. And I get how that could be a, a name, but just, you know, it doesn't yeah. hook you the way that it would. That Pride and Prejudice does, yeah. And an editor yeah. actually rejected it for the very like when she was first trying to get it published he rejected it without ever reading it and it wasn't until 14 years later that she finds success with sense and sensibility that people then ask her what her next story is and she said well i actually have this novel that was never published then they release it to the world and maybe it's the whole language use on the alliteration of the titles pride right. and prejudice yes, sense, sense and sensibility, and sensibility. like yeah. it maybe that's why that just jumps out at you more than first impressions yeah, my first impression so. of first impressions is not very good. No, I agree. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> ooh, not a strong title there, Austin. You can tell good stories, but maybe you need some work with the titling. Yeah, I know we're not supposed <laughs> to judge a book by its cover, but I'm judging that one. Well, but you know, you you kind of like I know that that is a phrase, but like I know back in the day, and I'm sure you probably did the same. Whenever you would go like to a blockbuster mm -hmm. video store, back when we rented tapes or dvds or whatever back in the you good didn't... old days <laughs> yes please be kind and rewind but you kind of had to do that with movies mm. because you didn't have a cell phone with you at the time that you could have pulled up and read a review or something you literally look at the box cover art yep. you flip it over and read the summary and there may be a little small corner of the thing where you know it has a line from a critic review like you know a sentence like great yeah. movie blah 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 or something but generally, that's it. That's all you did have to use to you judge a movie by its cover. Yep. And it yeah. worked. Well, and now there's 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 big money in book cover art now, right? So everyone's definitely judging by first impressions. Just they weren't probably going to be reading that novel. Probably not. I doubt first impressions would get 17 films. <laughs> Pro probably not so much. But cover art is certainly something to consider. And again, thank you to Amber at Kohoku yes. Dragon for our wonderful show art. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you introduced me to her um, yes. because now now I'm following her account and and experiencing all of her art. And I'm like, oh, I love that. So yes, so such great work. So thank mm -hmm. you again, Amber. And with that, we are just about out of time this week for our adventure. And we have to return back to our 2021 timeline of real life. And we thank you for joining us and making it to the end of our episode. And if you didn't, then I hope that your pen runs out of ink. <sighs> That's right in mid sentence yes Oof. right when you're trying to you know sign your name or something and then all that's left is a pen of a different color oh that's the worst <laughs> yes but since you made it to the end of the show mm -hmm. may your pen never run out of ink absolutely thank you guys so much for joining us this week and like always you know drop us a line with any questions concerns queries or freakouts Yes, and follow us on Instagram at Time Machine with Trish and Mike. Send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear where you're listening to us from. Absolutely. Yes, and we'll see you next week right here on The Time Machine.